Well, uh, as I said, difficult message again today. Very, very challenging. Uh, we're coming to the end today of our study of the book of Matthew. We began, uh, I, Jerry got me thinking about this last week, so I went back and looked. Uh, we began our study of the book of, of Matthew's gospel in January of 2013. So we didn't rush. Uh, we did not rush, and I went back and I actually looked at several of the first sermons. And uh, I remember one of, the, one of the things we said was our purpose for studying this is because we want to fall in love with Jesus. Not just say hypothetically, I believe in Jesus, but to look at the record that God has given us so we can know who he is and what he's about. And, and when we want to read this, we don't want to just say, okay, I'll follow. But we want to say, yeah. This is a man that I want to follow. This is a man that I want to live my life after. We want to look at, at Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, and we want to say, if I can't trust Jesus, I can't trust anybody. I'm going to put my faith here. I'm going to plant my flag here. I'm going to live here. I'm going to die here, right here, because there's nothing else in this entire world uh, that looks like Jesus, like Jesus Christ. So I thought it would be good just to review some of our material uh, from, from prim this is from February of uh, 2013. Here's what I wrote. Jesus is one of the most important people in the entire history of the human race. Even if you don't believe he is God incarnate, it's still impossible to deny that the course of human history was astoundingly redirected by this one man, this one man on the ragged edge of the Roman Empire. The world today wouldn't even remotely look the way it does if it were not for Christ. It's almost, it probably is impossible to imagine what the modern world would look like if Christ had never lived. So the question today is, what does Jesus want me to do? This is how, right at the beginning, we started the book of Matthew, okay? Now we've learned about Jesus. Now today we're going to answer that question completely with the book of Matthew, the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ now in the rearview mirror. What does Jesus want me to do? This is a good question for anybody, uh, but especially if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you consider yourself a Christian? Do you consider yourself somebody who's given your life to Jesus? Have you said, I'm going to follow Jesus? Then this is a big question. What does Jesus expect of me? What does Jesus want me to do? What is important to Jesus? Well, one way to look at what's important in his life is what did he do? What did he expect his followers who are around him to do? These are the same questions that the very first generation of Christians uh, had to answer. And they didn't have the New Testament. You think about that? The very first couple generations of Christians, when the New Testament was still being written, uh, they had to answer these questions about Jesus Christ. And remember we talked about the fella who said... Uh, uh, Papias, we didn't talk about him. I studied about him and decided not to talk about him last week. But we've talked about him previously in church, so maybe some of you remember. Uh, this fellow named Papias said, uh, I prefer not to read what people have written about Christ. I prefer to talk to the living witness. And he, he names several of the apostles and then names some people who have spoken with the apostles. He says, when they come into town, I like to hear from them directly what they have to say about Jesus. Isn't that wonderful that we have people who... who uh, who were right there in that first generation, those first couple generations, but they did not have the New Testament the way we do. And so, uh, who is Jesus? What is he about? What does he expect of them? And to answer that question there, we have the Apostle Matthew, and he writes a record of the life of Christ. And probably copies of this were made, possibly at different languages at the same time, but anyways, copies of this were made, and they were sent out to wherever there was a gathering of believers, wherever there was a church in various locations, they'd copy down this gospel that Matthew wrote, and they already had uh, several of the letters of Paul, and they'd copy these down, and they'd be sending them out. And remember, Peter, Peter, the apostle Peter, claims already while the Bible was being written, as Peter's writing, he says, uh, he calls Paul's writing scripture. People knew right away that this is going to be part of the Bible, and we saw that first century pastors understood that these writings were were to be the New Testament. So imagine, and this is what we did to start off when we were just starting our study, imagine you are one of those first century Christians. 
and you are blessed to hear the reading of Matthew for the very first time. So you're sitting there, and a man uh, would have stood up when the, when the gospel came, and he would have began reading this, this newly arrived parchment, this newly arrived document, and right away it would have tell you where Christ fits into God's big plan. You hear this miraculous circumstance of Christ's birth. This is no ordinary child. You listen as the Holy Spirit is introduced. You learn that the Messiah was given the name Jesus because, why? He would save his people from their sins. Now that tells us a little about ourselves. Jesus Christ would not have come unless we were not, if we were not messed up. There would be no cross if we could get to heaven by our own good deeds. There would be no cross. Why would he have to die? Jesus came to save us from our sins. Any church, any, any uh, gospel, quote-unquote gospel, that doesn't talk about the sinfulness of humanity is a false gospel. Jesus came to save us because we're in a mess. He came to save people, his people, from their sins. And then right away at the beginning of Matthew, you hear prophecy that, uh, uh, prophecy that Jesus would be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus is God with us. And you realize that you're sitting in this first century church that this has already come true and that you and the other Christians recognize that Jesus is God incarnate, God made flesh, God who came down to save his people from their sins. This is a revolutionary thought throughout the world in every culture. Human beings are taught to serve God or the gods and, are taught, uh, and uh, too are taught to serve and obey God. Christians too are taught to serve and obey God, but there's a difference here. We're caught to ser taught to serve and obey a God that came to serve us. And he said, follow my example. He came and he laid down his prerogatives. He laid down his, right, his rights. Uh, he accepted hardship in the name of love. And he accepted the cross in order to save us from our sins. God in the form of a servant, a willing servant, willing to suffer, willing to face scorn, willing to face rejection because he loves you and he wants you to be in heaven with him. This is our Lord. This is our God, as we sang in the song this morning. This is our God, the servant king. And you would have listened to all of this reading of the Gospel of Matthew and fallen in love with Christ once again. I want to ask you, are we here just out of rote, out of ritual, out of responsibility? Uh, some days that's what it needs to get us out of bed. But are we here do we want to be here because we see such a good God? We see how wonderful Jesus is. We say, yeah, okay, I'm going to live for that. Living for myself, living for the almighty dollar, living for just to hold on to happiness as long as I can, as elusive as it is, living to hold on to our health, which is doomed to fail. All of these things are like putting all your life savings on a horse with a broken leg. You cannot succeed. You will end in disappointment. Living for anything else than Jesus Christ makes no sense. And we, we've often heard this phrase, uh, I've often quoted it, an old poem, only one life, too soon passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Okay, now let's le read from Matthew 28. Matthew 28, uh, 16, from verse 16. So this is after the death and resurrection of Christ. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You know, if you're making up a religion, you don't need to add the point that doubting Thomas doubted at first. <laughs> you don't need to add the point that when they first heard that Jesus Christ was resurrected, they didn't want to believe it, they couldn't believe it. Why would you put that in there unless the di disciples, yeah, some doubted them. It's, they doubted at first. It's, it's kind of natural to doubt that a guy who you saw hammered to a cross and die was born again, resurrected again to a new life. And yet, when he stood in their midst and, and ate with them on several occasions and they could touch him and he taught them, they stopped doubting, as most people would. Uh, and they went on to live their lives, and many of them give their lives uh, to tell other people that God is real, that God loves them, that Jesus Christ has provided a way, he's the Savior. Then Jesus came to them and said, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Well, that's God's authority. He says, this is mine. This is mine. Therefore, this is what I want you to do. Do you think if you call yourself a Christian, you ought to perk up at that point? Jesus, who just died on the cross, he, he rose again, says, I have all authority. Therefore, this is what I want you to do. If you call yourself a Christian, this great commission, what comes next, is hugely important. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, go, and make disciples of all nations. If your theology says, well, we can't really make anybody anything, then go find a different theology. Jesus said to you, go and make disciples. That's effort on our part. We don't just sit and have, I have a lot of faith that if God wants it to happen, it will happen. Get off your keister, start talking to people, and start winning disciples. Now, a disciple is not just somebody who says, do you, do you believe in Jesus? Will you pray with me and say, I believe in Jesus? Yeah, sure. Sign your paper here. Now you're a Christian. You've got to have a disciple is somebody who says, who follows after. Their, their teacher leads and they follow after. We're supposed to make disciples of the world. We're supposed to bring all people, have, have them faith in Jesus Christ and help them to live as true disciples. Well, well that sounds like uh, you're saying people have to do something, like they have to obey or something. Well... Let's just see what Jesus says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. There is a lot of, you know, what is Jesus? Who does he think he is? God? Maybe. There's a lot of, a. this is really authoritarian, isn't it? As an American, uh, we don't like people telling us what to do. Jesus says, I have all authority. Well, hey, who do you think you are? Don't I have rights over my own life? He says, I have all authority on heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go. Well, I'd just rather sit, thank you. Okay. Therefore, go. All right, go and find peace and contentment and happiness and just please myself. Go and do good deeds. Go and do things that make me feel better about myself. You go and you make disciples. You make disciples of all nations. The word nations here is where we get our word ethnicity from. It's ethnos in Greek. I want, and I always pray for a salt and pepper church. We want people uh, from every uh, income level. We want people from every education level. We want people that have had uh, di difficult lives and, and more difficult lives. I almost said easy lives. Nobody's had an easy life. Some people have had more difficult lives. We want people who are, are strong and energetic, people who are, are, are elderly or sick, uh, struggling with different things. We want people, uh, Latinos. We want uh, people, African Americans. We want uh, people from Ireland. We want people from, from Peru. We want people from from every walk of life because heaven is going to look like that. And if you're uncomfortable with people who look different than you and talk different than you and then trust, uh, 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 dress differently than you, <laughs> if you're uncomfortable with that, either fix it or leave the church. And I don't want to hear you talking about any other race or group of people behind their back in a way that would make them feel unwelcome in our church. Fix it. Please, because I don't want you to leave, but fix it. And guess what? You are going to be very unhappy until you fix it, because heaven's going to be packed with people from every walk of life, from every culture. Jesus Christ said, my goal is that you go out and get every ethnic group, every small group, every, every people group, everywhere that exists. Bring the good news that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Let people know that God loves them. Let people know that no matter how messed up their life is, God is willing to forgive and God wants to love them and bring them in the family. And I want to put my arm around this guy and I want to put my arm around that guy and say, you're my brother, no matter how you talk funny. Yeah, you're my sister. And, and we're going to have people from all these different places and we should get used to it now. And we should have a heart that we want to go in and, and, and help and let our church be in a, a mirror image of what heaven's going to be like, this salt and pepper church.
where everybody's mixed up and everybody's different. And yeah, that means you've got to go outside of your comfort zone. And yeah, that means people are going to be different than you're used to. That's not a bad thing. We can grow up just a little bit. So Jesus Christ says, go out, go out, make disciples. This is a strong message. This is a difficult message. Can I just go out and tell people Jesus Christ is warm and fuzzy, and if you like warm, fuzzy things, you can sit in with us and we'll all be warm, fuzzy together. And our church is really nice because we'll never challenge you with anything difficult. What? What is that? If when we saw that video that was being passed around on Facebook, my first thought was, wow, if you don't sound like Jesus, if you don't sound like the New Testament, if you don't sound like the Bible, if you don't sound like the apostles, shut your mouth. Don't call yourself a church. If you're afraid to say the things that Jesus said, if you're afraid to say this, th I told you it's a difficult message. Brothers and sisters, if we're doing religion in a way that we feel like we have to make an excuse for these exclusive claims, for these strong truths that we're taught, then our, what we're calling Christianity isn't what Jesus Christ and his disciples were trying to teach. Which means, hopefully we're just a little bit wrong, you know, and we're just a little off path and we can get on, but it could mean we're totally off track and we're believing a false gospel. And we need to humble ourselves and say, Lord God, please forgive I was trying to make religion comfortable. I was trying to make you in my image instead of me being conformed to your image. Do you see the danger with that? Do you see the danger with that? I'm reading this and I'm, trying to, I'm always trying to make excuses so it doesn't really mean what it says. Christianity that does not preach the cross, Christianity that does not say you're a sinner, get right with God, Christianity does not say come and follow me, Jesus Christ is our good master, our good teacher, let's obey everything he's taught. Christianity doesn't talk like that. It's actually some other religion. It's not Christianity. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is an authoritarian statement. Jesus Christ is talking from a position of authority. He just died for our sins. He rose again. Jesus, guess what? When, he, when this idea, I'll give him my soul, but I don't, I don't want to give him my pocketbook. I'll give him my soul, but I don't want to give him my relationships. I'll give him my soul, but I don't want to give him my mouth. I'll give him my soul, but I don't want to give him my, 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 my habits and attitudes. You know, you know what your soul means, right? It means everything you are. Jesus Christ wants everything we, we are. He bought us completely with his perfect blood shed on the cross for us. And he says, therefore, go. You go. Are you a Christian? Go, be willing to go, look for opportunities, go and make disciples of all nations. He says, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to take a little aside, kind of connect back to our message last week when we were talking about all these reasons to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, you're sometimes going to hear, if you study these things, some scholars will say that that phrase, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was not in the original text. The reason it's in your Bible is because it is in the original text. But so the reason some scholars say that is not because there's any old documents without this phrase in there. Our old texts have that phrase in there. Isn't that interesting? So, so the oldest versions of the end of Matthew that we have, because remember, you've heard me say before, the end of Mark is, not, is a late edition. So I'm willing to say that if it's true. Uh, the end of Matthew, the oldest versions we have of the end of Matthew look just like this. So why is it that some scholars say that the idea of the Trinity is not in the original text? Well, one, they don't want the Trinity in there. They don't want God loving us enough to come down himself, God incarnate, to die for our sins. So what they do is there was this fellow named Eusebius. He lived in the 300s. So that's, you know, a long time after. And he was part of that, you often hear, of the Council of Nicaea. He wrote about the end of Matthew 18 times and never mentioned Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He just basi you know, he basically said, and Jesus, our Lord, told us to go and make disciples. And maybe he said, go and make disciples and baptize him. He never mentioned Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Until after the Council of Nicaea, then he says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I guess at least once, I don't know how many times. And so they take that one guy who lived several hundred years later and say, well, he didn't say it before 325, 
Council of Nicaea, so that must mean that it changed at that point. They're totally disregarding the fact that all the old fragments we have, all the old documents we have, have it in there. And guess what? Not only the Bible, but we have several, uh, Ignatius is one, we have several early pastors uh, who lived first century, second century, uh, third century, all these guys before the Council of Nicaea, and guess what? When they talk about Matthew, they say, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So these guys were writing, lived and died before Eusebius was even born, and they're saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is what I was warning you about last week, when there's tricky people who should know better. We have the evidence, and remember we talked about the Didache? It's not in the Bible, but it very, it's called the Didache, the teaching of the apostles. It's very possibly was written by the apostles, or at least a collection of what they taught. It's very possibly from that first century church, written at the same time that the Bible was being written. We didn't even have this document until 1882. Isn't that cool? I love science. Dig up some more stuff. The more you dig up, the more we can trust this book. And, and so in, in the Didache twice talks about baptizing. It talks about how to baptize. We talked about this when we did our baptisms for, for Adam and the others uh, this summer, right, at the swimming pool. And the Didache says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have all these sources going back to the right at the birth of Christianity. Matthew, the way we have it now, is the way Matthew was written back then. And when some scholar goes on television and says, well, Eusebius, remember, Eusebius lived 300 years later, okay? That's a big deal. And that scholar should know better. Why is he trying to be tricky? Because take Jesus out of the gospel, take the cross out of the gospel, take God coming down and dying for our sins, and we no longer have a gospel. We no longer have a gospel. So Jesus says, baptize them, make them disciples, baptize them, and teach them. Teaching has to be a part of what we do. Teach them what? What do we got to teach him? What do we got to teach him? Big voice? Obey everything, yeah. Let's try that again. What are we supposed to teach people? Obey. Everything. Everything that I commanded you. And again, Jesus is on this power trip. He actually thinks that he has a right to tell us what to do. Well, I agree with him. You know, he bought me with his blood. He is God incarnate. And then he gives us this promise because it's going to be hard to live as a Christian. He says, surely I'm with you always until the very end of the age. And look at that. We've come full circle now. Matthew began with the declaration that Jesus would be God with us. And now we see Jesus claims the authority of God. And look what else he says. He started by saying Jesus was God with us, Emmanuel. And now Jesus says, and I'm going to be with you always. Isn't that beautiful? Matthew knew what he was doing when he wrote this. He started it off raising a question, how we can respond to Jesus, who is Jesus. Now we've answered the question, who is Jesus, and Jesus told us what to do. He said, I died so that he could, could be in heaven. Now you guys go and live your life so that more people can be in heaven. Our mission is to draw people to Jesus, have them have faith in Jesus, enough faith to obey him and to live their lives after him. We're supposed to go out and bring in everybody from every different ethnic group. And Jesus was going to be Emmanuel, God with us, and Jesus says, go and do this, and I'm going to be with you, and I will not leave you. Jesus doesn't divorce his children. He's going to be with us through every hardship and every trial because this life is packed full of tears and disappointment and broken dreams and things we hoped for not turning out the way we wanted. And Jesus says, I'm going to be with you through it all. Well, what about when I blow it and, and I'm so upset with myself? Jesus is with us during that time too. Grace, grace that he bought for us on the cross is for the forgiveness of sins. He doesn't leave us when we sin. He pours on the grace when we sin. Does that make sense? Jesus accomplished what he set out to do. We began... Matthew uh, was seeing Jesus born to accomplish the mission of saving our souls by dying for our sins. And now we see Jesus standing victorious over the grave. He accomplished what he set out to do. Now he's calling us to go, go, draw all people to him, make disciples, teach them to obey everything. And Jesus says, 
I have all authority, therefore, this is what I want you to do. Oh, Christian, this is your life's purpose. I believe this is what God wanted me to say this morning. I believe that's why we're here this morning. Brothers and sisters, we are here to fulfill this mission that Christ launched. He died so that people could know him. If we love Jesus, how could we live our lives without burning for that same passion? If he was willing to do that for us, he says, come on now. Let's go get more people in the family. What is the only rational, what is the only sane, what is the only loving response to that? Christian, this is your life's purpose. Teach people to obey. Bring them into salvation that Jesus Christ brought, bought with his blood. Failure to work this great commission is to miss God's will for your life and the very purpose for your existence. Do you think I stated it too strong? Here's Jesus. who endured suffering, mockery, being spit on, set aside all the glory of heaven so that we could be forgiven. I am free of my sin. I'm forgiven. I am going to heaven, not because I'm good, but because he's good. And he's standing before us with holes in his hands. And he says, I have all authority. Now, therefore, listen up. Because I have authority, this is what you got to do. Go and make disciples of every people group. Baptize these people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And as a church, as a people, we want to say, okay, sometimes I get off track. Sometimes I have my own priorities. Sometimes I'm doing my own thing. I've heard the command. And I want to say, yes, sir. I've heard the command, and I don't want to, I want to dither. I don't want to make excuses. I don't want to argue. I want more people to be in heaven because of my church. I want more people to be in heaven because of my life. I want more people to have their sins wiped away because of the way I spent these precious hours of my existence. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Here we are, Lord. You've commanded us to go. Please send us. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.